Good morning, everyone. It's so lovely to be able to be here today to share with you. And as we're just singing those songs, how beautiful it is to be able to come together and worship our God, to be able to declare truths together and sing to Him, sing together to Him. Well, today I am excited to continue on in our series, Starting Point. And we, Pastor Ron has been sharing over the theme of looking at where we're starting from this year so that we can go on, keep on going on in this year. And so today I'm going to look at this theme of obedience, remaining obedient. What does that mean? How do we do that? And I've shared on obedience a few times throughout my life in sermons on the theme of obedience. And I sometimes think, I don't know if I'm like qualified enough to share on obedience, but that's not really the point. I think obedience more is that we're just trying to live the way God is calling us to live each day. And so I share on this topic of obedience with you today, not as somebody who has it all together, because I don't, but as somebody who's just trying to follow Jesus and just sharing the different things that he's shown me to share those things with you. So obedience is defined on dictionary.com as obeying or willing to obey or complying with submissive to authority. So it's about complying, submitting, obeying, willing to obey, authority. And automatically, when I look at those words, I see words that people or maybe our culture struggles with. We hear the words comply, submit, obey authority, and some people just cringe. Like you hear that word and you just go, nope, I do not want to submit. I don't want to comply. I don't want to listen to authority. Now, there's some times where that may be appropriate to not comply and not submit. But for the most part, it's important that we do submit and that we do comply to certain authorities. I was thinking about this, and have you ever been in a car overseas? Some of you have. I know my first experience of driving overseas was in New Zealand, which felt pretty similar to Australia because I I felt like we had similar road rules. Someone can confirm with me if we do. I don't know. But I also went to the Philippines, and the road rules there are very, very different to the road rules that we have here. And if you've been to a country where the road rules are completely different to here, you'll understand. And it made me, while we were safe and while it worked and we went in an accident, it made me very thankful to live in a country where seatbelts and helmets and um, roadworthy vehicles, um, what else was the, just, oh, baby car seats, made me thankful that those things are not just like an option. They're a requirement. And those things are a requirement because... They keep us safe. They make, they're designed there to protect us so that if something would happen, we would be okay. But then there's also other rules in place, road safety rules in place that we have to keep us safe. For example, we have speed limits and speed limits aren't there. We all know that they're not there um, to just keep us from having fun. They're there to keep us safe, to keep us alert, able to drive at a safe speed. But the thing is, sometimes we might go against that. We might push that maybe without thinking. Sometimes it's an accident or maybe sometimes we just want to get somewhere really quickly. But sometimes things can happen when we're not submitting to those rules. And so I think we could all agree that submitting and complying to the road safety requirements, that's a good thing. Like being obedient to those things, that's a good thing. Those things are put in place to protect us so that we can all just work together on the roads. But I know, I think it's kind of interesting. Sometimes though, like we know the road rules and then we get annoyed at people when they don't follow them. Like, have you ever seen somebody not indicate right and then you're just like, well, correctly? And, and you're like, you didn't indicate. Like, what are you doing? That may have been me, and I'm sorry if I indicated wrong when I was in front of you. Sometimes I'm, like, driving, and then I'm like, oh, change direction. Um, 
I don't mean to do that intentionally, it's just sometimes what happens, perhaps you're in the same boat as me. But we can get annoyed when people break the road rules. Or sometimes people purposely defy these rules and go, no, don't really care, I'm just going to do what I want, doesn't matter what the authorities say because they can't catch me. But what happens when they do get caught? Eventually something's going to happen and the authorities, they're going to get caught out and they're going to have to be held accountable for what has happened. If you decide to push the speed limit and go against what the law requires, you're probably going to end up with a speeding ticket. We're going to be held accountable. Now, today, I'm not here to talk about being obedient to the road rules. I think we all know that that's probably a good thing, or it is a good thing to do. We're talking about obedience to God. But before we get into that part of obedience to God, this is like a side note, um, is obeying the laws of the land. And Paul talks about this in Romans 13, verses 1 to 7. He says, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing what is right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Well, do what's right and they will honour you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but to keep a clear conscience. Pay your taxes too for the same reason, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honour to those who are in authority. So we need to give respect and honour to those who are in authority over us. Doesn't mean necessarily that we will always agree, but they, we should be respectful and honouring. But it is also clear through Scripture that there are times when we need to obey God's laws above what the governing authorities are calling us to do because we need to obey God rather than men. And so in that case, we need to obey God. And those things will come up over time. But today I wanted us to get thinking about what is it to be obedient to God. So part of being obedient to God is obeying our authorities and obeying God in that. But what does that look like? When it comes to obeying God, God is our creator. God made us. He knows us. He has our best interests at heart. So why would we not want to obey him? When I think of obeying God, when I think of obedience to God, For me, it makes so much sense because if you've given your heart to Jesus, if you've said, Lord, I want to follow you for my whole life, then what we're saying is I want to give up my own ways and God, I want to obey you and I'm going to follow you. And so obedience makes sense because that's what we've said that we would like to do. But the thing is, if God, if we haven't done that, then it might not make sense for us to obey God. If we haven't given our heart to Jesus, then it doesn't quite make sense to obey what he said. But the thing is, God is our ultimate authority. Whether we believe it or not, the Lord God is on the throne. Nothing is like him. No one is like him. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. And we're going to do that willingly with praise and thankfulness because we have been able to walk with Him and journey with Him. And it's such an amazing moment to stand before Him. Or we'll do that with fear and trembling because we didn't choose to follow Jesus while we had the opportunity to do that on earth. But either way, either way, we're going to recognise who God is. And so because you're here today, I suspect that you are wanting to follow Him. You're wanting to obey Him. You're wanting to trust God. 
and seek him and serve him with your life. But what does it mean to be obedient to God? What does that mean? I actually asked someone this week that question. I just asked them, what does it mean to obey God? And the first thing that they said was, well, that's a big question. That's a hard question. And I was like, well, what? why is that a hard question? And so I gave them a moment to think about it. And their answer, I'll explain in a minute, but it was basically just listening to God and doing what he says. So think to yourself for a moment, how would you answer the question, what does it mean to be obedient to God? After they thought about that question, they responded with something like, because I don't remember exactly word for word, but it was something, something like reading the Bible, knowing what it says, and then listening to what it says and doing it. Perhaps your answer was something similar. I think we can get so caught up in what it means to obey God that we feel like it's all these big things that we need to do. Like if I'm going to obey God, you think of the different people who you've seen who maybe they packed up everything just to follow Jesus and they're on this big adventure and it's like this huge obedience call. But I think obedience is also in the smaller things. It's in our daily, consistent choices that we make, moment by moment. And as we do these things day by day, we'll start to notice or be able to be trusted with the big things that God calls us to do. So as we think about the year ahead, I want to get you thinking. Start thinking about where you're starting off this year now. What is your starting point in your journey with God this year? And where would you like to be in another 12 months? I know one way to look at if you've grown with God is to look at where you were this time last year and where you are now. Have you grown? Do you know more, but do you know him more? Do you recognise changes in you that he has done in your heart? That's how we know we've grown. And so where do you want to go this year? What is your starting point? If we want to grow closer to God, if we want to be obedient to him, there are things that we're just going to have to start doing and there's going to be some things that we have to stop doing. So perhaps you want to grow closer to God. You probably already know some things that you need to start and you need to stop. But if we want to love others better, then there's also going to be things we need to start and stop doing. Perhaps you've started to get some new habits or some new routines because it's a new year and often when we start the new year, we kind of get these new year's resolution things that we want to try and do and commit to the whole year. How are we going with those if you did have any? The truth is that habits and routines we get consistent in are the trajectory for our life at that point. So it's really important that we choose wisely what habits and routines we're actually going to implement into our lives and allow to influence us. Some habits or routines that you might have is you might get up in the morning and read your Bible. A habit or routine you might have without even really thinking about it is waking up, rolling over and checking your phone. Which one is going to help you draw closer to God? Which one do you want to keep doing? Which one do you need to stop? Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your, give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. Daily. Doing something daily is how we get consistent. So think of the daily habits and routines you currently have. How many of those help you pursue Jesus? How many of those help you to love others? How many of those help you to be kind and patient? One thing that I've learned is that obedience is rarely convenient. And so that means obedience to God actually takes time, energy, effort, stepping out of our comfort zones in order to do some of these things. And so what I wanted to share today were just some things that we can put in place starting now and to continue on into this year to help us become more obedient to God and what that looks like in our life. And so the first one, it's ones you probably know, well, if, yeah, you probably know about them. The first one is to read 
and know God's word and to pray. See, these are things that we all say that Christians should do. Christians, or we think Christians should do. And it's true, we should be doing them. Um, But we should read and know God's word. We should be reading the Bible and we should spend time in prayer. And Jesus did this. See, Jesus knew the scriptures. He taught what the scriptures meant. And it's likely that as he was growing up, he was taught He was taught what the Hebrew Bible said or what we know as the Old Testament. And we see throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus using those, referencing those scriptures in how he shares and how he teaches and how he explains them. In Luke chapter four, we read when Jesus was tempted just before his ministry and three times Jesus was able to respond back to Satan who was trying to tempt him with what the scriptures say. And he could do this because he knew what the scriptures said. If we don't know what the scriptures say, then we can't put, apply that to our lives. So we see Jesus read, know, recite, teach, and use the scriptures to explain what he is saying. And there are so many verses throughout the gospels that show him doing that. But I wanted to read one from Luke chapter four, verses 16 to 21. And it says, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home. He went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And he rolled up that scroll and handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then they began to speak to them. The scriptures you've just heard have been fulfilled this very day. And then continuing in verse 31 to 32, then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every Sabbath day. There too, the people were amazed at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. Jesus spoke with authority. He was Jesus, and he knew exactly what he was talking about because he knew it, he read it, but he also lived it out in his actions. We know that he did fulfill what he read from the prophet Isaiah. He did bring good news. He did heal. He did help the blind to see He knew that it wasn't just a matter of knowing the scriptures, but doing them too. And there are so many other verses that show that, but we also see Jesus pray. We see Jesus pray a lot. And so just a few references, Luke chapter 5, 16, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Or Matthew 14, 23, after sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Mark 1, 35, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Jesus made sure that no matter what was going on in his life, he found a time or made time to pray alone, to take a walk, take a step back and just be alone and pray. Are we consistent in this? And if you're a Christian, it's likely that you already know you're meant to be reading the Bible, you're meant to be praying. There's verses about prayer, like 1 Thessalonians 5.17, which says, never stop praying. And so we might know that we're meant to do this, but how are we going with that? Perhaps you are really good at spending time in the Bible, spending time reading it, meditating on it. You're really good at spending time in prayer. And perhaps that's something that you want to start to get consistent in this year, start to make a daily, daily habit, daily part of your routine. So how do we go with those few things? If you don't know how to read your Bible or you don't know how to pray, that's okay because you can learn and we can show you how to do that. Our Bible studies are starting up again and that's a perfect opportunity and perfect place to learn how to read the Bible. Or in other places, prayer meetings, if you're not sure how to pray or praying out loud makes you nervous, that's okay because it's something that you can learn to do. And I'd encourage you to join and be part of prayer meetings because they're a place and an opportunity where we learn how to pray and what it looks like to talk to God. 
When I first gave my heart to Jesus, I didn't know how to pray or how to read the Bible. But one thing I started to do was to go to the Saturday morning prayer meeting that happens here at 7 a.m. every Saturday. And that was a place where I learned how to pray. I didn't always pray out loud because that was scary because there were people there and what if I said the wrong thing? But as I started to go, I started to learn how to pray. And there will be some moments, which maybe you can relate, where I really felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me, saying, you should pray, you need to pray. And then I'd be like, I can't speak because that's a bit scary. And then I wouldn't pray, but I'd just pray in my head. And while that's okay, I think those were opportunities for me to grow and learn how to pray more. So I want to encourage you, if that kind of thing makes you nervous, it's okay, because no one's actually judging you when you're praying. We're just there to pray and be with each other and grow together. But Jesus also teaches us how to pray. He taught his disciples how to pray, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And you can find it in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Jesus says, pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. That's how we can learn how to pray too. And so if we can get consistent in these few areas and be intentional about our time learning and reading the Bible and intentional in prayer, then we're going to start to notice changes in us. We're going to start to notice that we are going to see things, learn things, and we're going to want to be obedient in that. Because how can we obedient, be obedient to God if we aren't reading the Bible for ourselves? We're not, not going to know what we're meant to do. And so there's those two things. There's read the Bible and pray or know the Bible and pray. But then the next thing is just do. Just do it. Just go, serve, and love. See, obedience, there's, there's so much that we can learn, those, those important habits that we need to have so that we can grow and know more about God. But then there's other things where we need to use our gifts and have those opportunities to do what God's Word says because we aren't called to just sit and soak. We aren't called to just keep on learning and doing nothing with what we've learnt. There's a whole heap of good stuff that we can listen to and a whole heap of good stuff that we can read. But if we aren't doing, if it's not coming out as action, then are we really obeying? James, chapter, James wrote this in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 27. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself and then you walk away and you forget what you look like. But if you carefully look into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious, but you don't control your tongue, You are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. There are many people who would call themselves Christians and they can quote Bible verses, they'll be in a church every Sunday, but then when it comes down to doing what it says, Sometimes they can be mean. (laughs) Like, you might know people like this. I had a friend sharing with me once that um, she would go to work and she would um, just serve different people each day at work and there was this one person who would come and they would be really rude and basically mean. But then they met them somewhere else and turns out that they were a Christian. But that kind, that doesn't add up. Because if we're reading the Bible and doing what it says, it means that we're going to be loving. It means that we're going to be kind and generous and compassionate. I know for me, I'm not perfect and I have moments and sometimes I will lash out in those times. But that's where we have to come back to the starting point and ask God for forgiveness and come back to what it is to love him. 
to serve him, to love others. We're meant to be different to the world. We're meant to shine bright like stars, as Philippians talks about. We're meant to be loving. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 to 20. A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree tree can't produce good fruit. That's a tongue twister. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. So what kind of fruit are we producing in our lives? Do those around us know that we love them? Do those around us know that we follow Jesus because of our love, by the way that we talk, by the way that we share? James wrote in James chapter 2, 14 to 17, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say, I have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but you don't give any, that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? See, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Having faith and reading the Bible and praying and being in church doesn't mean much unless it is shown in how we live, if it doesn't impact how we treat each other. Loving others is not a natural thing that we just do, though. See, naturally, I want, well, I want, I want my own way. I want things to work out as I have them planned. And as soon as something doesn't go according to my plan, I know for myself, and my husband would agree, that... I get a little bit cranky, and sometimes that comes out. Other times I'm able to take a big breath and go, it's okay. doesn't have to be my own way. Naturally, loving others and, and taking interest in others is not something that we do, but Jesus helps us to do that. Jesus shows us how to do that. Jesus has given us the perfect example in that. And he talked about it when talking with the religious leaders in Matthew 22, 35 to 40. It says, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trip him up with this question, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbour as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love God with everything that you have and then love others as you love yourself. It's this practical kind of love. It's this love that meets needs. It's this love that checks in on each other. It's what Paul talks about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 to 7. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but I didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and if I even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of wrongs of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. That is love. And when I look at that list or those 
components of what love is. Loving others can be really hard because sometimes there's people that are hard to love or sometimes it's just me and I'm feeling irritated and my response can't be so, it doesn't always come as one of love. See, we can, or I can go to church, I can tithe, I can serve, I can preach, but if I don't love people, then I miss the point. And if we don't love others, then we've missed the point because love changes everything. It's this love that we've been reading about and we've been talking about every week. We've been talking about today. It's this love that Jesus has for us. Philippians chapter 2, one of my favourite passages of all time. Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi. In verse 3, he says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your for only your own interests, but take interest in others too. Loving others means pausing in conversation and not talking about ourselves so much, but taking genuine interest in what others have going on in their lives, genuine interest in what they like, genuinely caring for each other in love. It's the way Jesus loves us, caring so much for us and our interests. Continuing in verse five, it says, but you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus did that for us. Jesus did that because he loved us so much. He loved God so much. He submitted to God's plan and willingly went to the cross for us. Love is why Jesus came into this world. He showed us what it is to truly love others. He spent time with others. He went and talked to people that others wouldn't talk to. He washed his disciples' feet. He listened to people. He healed them. He loved them. He met them where they were at. It's what John 3.16 says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's it. So if we believe in God, if we trust him, if we want to obey him, if we've given ourselves to him, then we're going to do or want to do what Jesus did willingly knowing the word, consistently spending time in it, consistently spending time in prayer, talking to our heavenly father, willingly surrendering our will to God because we love him and love others and it's how we show our obedience to him. So what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about all of that that we've been talking about today? For some of you, you know that you want to be obedient to God this year and you want to make this year a year that you grow with Him. And so there's going to be some things that you start doing and perhaps you want to commit to join a Bible study group or commit to being at prayer meetings. For some of you, it might be, I'm going to commit to serving and going to use my gift in whatever area that is because I want to love others as I serve, as I help out in Sunday school or creche or on whatever, whatever part it is. Because that's a way that we can really love each other and invest into the people around us. In your sermon notes, there's a space at the bottom if you've got your sermon notes today. And it's where I really want to encourage you to make a note or a commitment, make a choice to be consistent in a certain area that you need to work on or work in. This is something that I encourage you to talk through with your small groups, to share with your small group the things that you want to work on this year, the areas that you want to get consistent in so that you can continue to be obedient to God or start to be obedient to God. Or maybe even perhaps as a small group, 
you want to work on something together and you want to become a group that prays or a group that loves others in a certain way or serves in a certain way. I want to encourage you and challenge you to commit to that. And there's a place to sign and date that, but it's a declaration to yourself and to God that you want to commit to whatever it is. This year, I, your name, commit to be consistent in reading my Bible or catching up with this person every week, investing in that life or serving through or whatever it may be. And I commit to doing this for the year or the next few months or forever. So what things do you want to commit to or do you need to commit to in your obedience to God? I want to finish with John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. And it's a passage, John chapter 15 just hits me every time I read it. But verses 9 to 17, Jesus says this, I have loved you, even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments, I remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. No, you are my friends. Since I have told you everything that the Father told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. Will you commit to that, to loving God, to loving each other and whatever that looks like for you this year? Will you pray with me? Lord God, I thank you. We thank you so much for your great love for us that that you have demonstrated to us what love is by sending your son, Jesus. That you loved us so much that you saw where we were at, recognised our our deep need of you, that you made us because you loved us, because you wanted us to be with you where, wanted us to be where you are. And God, I pray for each one of us, wherever we are at, listening in person or online, that God, I know that you can meet us wherever we are at today. I pray that our hearts would be listening to you, ready to respond to you in whatever that looks like. God, I pray that you would convict us of the things that you want changed in our hearts and in our lives, things that we need to start doing, things that we need to stop doing. And may we be willing to put those aside, willing to obey you so that we can be people of salt and light, so that we can be people who love others. Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do as we submit to you in that way this year. And Father, if we're struggling in certain things, trying to figure out what that means or or more of who you are, God, I thank you that you can reveal yourself to us and I ask that you'll continue to do that now. So just pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.